Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. I was skipping school to ride around the advert in Daughter County, Missouri area, looking for wildlife, which I often did. I just crossed the Castor River Bridge on the country road that now belong to Golden Cat to transport their mining. I saw a dark brown creature run across the road in front of me. It was on two legs, jumped across the road, and ran into the woods. It was gone in just seconds. I will never forget this and have only told my wife until now. This is for real. It was morning, heavy mist, and cold in an area of wooded hills and evergreen trees. On to the next one. East of Fredericktown in Madison County in Missouri, my son-in-law and I found a freshly made footprint of something that still haunts me today. We had been cutting firewood in a mostly remote area about 100 miles south of St. Louis, Missouri. It had rained hard all night prior to the morning of the sighting and the ground was well saturated. The print looked almost like a human print except for the size and the number of toes. The print was 14 and a half inches long, four and three quarter inches wide, and was sunk in the ground almost two inches deep. It had to be something that had a lot of weight to it. It also had three toes of which the inside toe was slightly larger than the other two. Unfortunately, we did not take a picture or make a cast of it. I wish I would have at least informed the conservation department about it. It was about 9 a.m. It had rained all night. The ground was saturated, but the weather that morning was warm and sunny. It was on an old gravel road that ran along a small ridge. I assumed the area had been used for logging several years ago. There was hardly any gravel left on that old road. On to the next one. On a gravel bank of the Little Niangua River between Climax Springs and Roach in Camden County, Missouri, my husband and I went for a two-day float on the Little Niangua. We camped in a two-man dome tent on a gravel bank where the river made a U-shaped bend. On the far side was a dirt cliff from flood water. The tent was hidden from view by underbrush. At about 2 a.m., I was awakened by splashing in the river close to us. Afraid, I woke my husband. I refused to let him go out to see what was there. I thought it was a bear. While we whispered about what to do, it must have hurt us. It started to run in our direction. Whatever it was, it ran past our tent on two legs. It was large enough to shake the ground we were sitting on as it ran past us. After it was quiet for a while, we did go out to see if we could find anything. There were no prints that we could find in the gravel, but there was a very foul odor in the air. We also noticed only the odor in the air. It smelled just like an animal that was dirty and maybe soiled itself. On to the next one. Near Ava in western Douglas County, just west of the KK Highway in Missouri, I was staying all night at my friend's house located off the KK Highway. This particular friend just lived a couple of miles from my home. She had told me about how she heard a loud, puppy-like howling noise and how she always felt like she was being followed when she went on walk in the woods that surrounded her home. She smoked and said that when she was out on these walks, 
she would at times hear something walking behind her, but when she lit her cigarette, the sound seemed to stop. Well, being fifteen and stupid at the time, I came up with this idea to go find whatever it was. I thought that whatever it was had to be scared of fire due to her whole cigarette analysis. So we took some hay from their barn and put it in paper bags. We put the bags on the ends of thick branches that we found to make these so-called torches. I secured the bag to the branch on one of these torches with my belt. So the adventure began. We headed across their field toward the wood. It was dusk at this time. The field was about one and a half length of a football field. I'm not into sports, so I really cannot tell you the actual feat. When we reached the edge of the wood, which is where the family dumped some trash, we looked at each other and decided this was not such a bright idea. We turned around and headed back to the house. When we were around midway through the field, something big and gray came darting towards us from the edge of the wood. The distance between us and it was probably around 200 feet. I took off running, without even telling my friend what I was running from. Thankfully, she followed. I didn't even realize I still had those torches in my hand, which I finally dropped when we reached the area of the barn, which was about 100 feet from the house. We ran into the house and stayed there for about 15 minutes. When I tried to fill her in about what I saw, after we got enough courage up, we went outside again. We could see about midway into the field, a large, gray-colored, ape-like creature squatting down in the brush of the field. It was just squatting there looking at us. That was enough, and back into the house we went. That night, we heard all kinds of commotion outside. The next morning, I had realized my belt was still out there by the barn. When we went to go get it, we found the torches ripped to shreds. My belt had been torn into pieces, with teeth marks all over the leather clasp. There were dents knocked into an old car the family had parked in the field. Later, my friend told me that a little red wagon that was dumped in the dump site was bent in half. Every time I stayed all night with this friend, whatever it was acted up with this type of behavior. My friend actually had a calf that died with its neck broken and twisted all the way around after I had stayed the night. I told my parents about this, and my dad actually wanted to go hunt whatever it was. I haven't told a lot of people about it because of fear that no one would believe me. I go camping sometimes and am still very alert to my surroundings to this day because I never want to see another one for the rest of my life. Jane said that she had heard loud, puppy-like howls a lot there. She herself claimed to have seen this creature on separate occasions. The sun was just starting to go down. There was still about an hour of sunlight left. It was in a field surrounded by wooded areas. There was a stream in this part of Beaver Creek that ran through the woods. My husband told me that his brother-in-law was fishing on Beaver Creek. He said that when his brother-in-law returned from fishing, he was white as a sheet. He said that he had seen Bigfoot standing on the shore as he was fishing. After that day, he refused to talk about it again. On to the next one. In a wooded area near Lake Springfield, which is connected with the James River near Springfield in Greene County in Missouri. On a real nice night in June, at about 9.30 p.m., myself and some other guys were talking after a softball game on what we wanted to do. So one of the guys suggested that we go to the old resort to see if anybody was partying there. The old resort was an abandoned piece of land that had a stretch of driveway from the road that went over a hill down a low part and up again. And on top of that second hill was an old, empty, in-ground swimming pool and a couple of small, collapsed buildings. I have never been there before, but heard of others talking about having a kegger there a time or two. So, we all loaded up in Dave's van, and off we went. 
there were six or seven of us. When we arrived, there we went, over a gate down the hill, and up the second hill to the old resort. No one was there, but I wanted to see the place for myself. The moon was real bright, and your eyes adjusted real well to that lighting condition, and after about twenty minutes of exploring, we decided to head back to the van. Now, there were two guys ahead of us, myself, Mike, and Jean, and three guys in the back of us, at about a distance of twenty-five feet between each of the groups. I'm about six foot three, and Jean is about six foot five, and Mike was short. As we were walking towards the van, in between the two hills, with woods on both sides of the path back to the road, I started to smell the worst odor that wasn't chemically produced. Something like a real bad B.O., musky and fecal. At that point, I said, Jean, what is that smell? And Jean said, it ain't a skunk, but it's just as bad. That's when Mike stopped in his track and began looking at our right. We stopped as well as Jean, looking where Mike was, and said, Oh my God, look! I looked and saw a figure about twenty feet from our location staring right back at us. I couldn't make out the facial features because the moon was behind it, but it stayed behind some brush just checking us out. I looked ahead of us and the guys in front were there and looked behind me and those guys were accounted for also. I said, what is that? And Jean said, I don't know, but I can't handle this. Off he went with me and Mike. After him passing by the guys in front, and when Jean got to the gate, he climbed it with two steps and didn't stop until he got to the van. I know this because I was right behind him. We waited for the rest and told them what happened. Then I began to rationalize that maybe we just smelled a dead animal and maybe it was just a cedar tree swaying in the breeze. So Dave and I went back to the spot, and there was no smell, and no tree at the spot where I saw it. Whatever we saw was taller than both Jean and I by a good half of a foot. Jean, Mike, and I saw it, but there were others that were nearby, but they didn't see it, and they were accounted for at the time of the event. It was nighttime, clear weather, and a full moon very near an old clothes bridge. It used to be really heavily forested at that time. Since then, there has been a lot of development going on. I found out that the local paper, the news leader, has published sightings around the Springfield Lake, James River, and Wilson Creek area, but not ours. We didn't have the gut to tell anyone. On to the next one. This report comes from a young boy who was out with a friend doing some deer scouting. In many families, hunting starts at an early age, and by the time the person reaches their teen years, they are a pretty seasoned hunter. Here is Dustin's report. Hello, my name is Dustin. I'm 14. Yes, I know that is young for this, but my buddy and I were walking around in the woods out back of our house, and we heard some knocks. And right after the knock, we heard a couple of screams and grunt-type noises. This was maybe 15 yards to the left of us. When we heard them, we looked up thinking it may be a deer, because that's what we were looking for. But no, it had to be a Bigfoot. It was every bit of seven and a half feet tall and was very hairy. The screams were not deep. They sounded as if it was a female. We live in Parksburg, West Virginia. We spotted this Bigfoot outside of Parksburg in Wood County, West Virginia. It was around 4.30 p.m. I believe it was on September 29th of 2011. It was on my buddy's birthday, who is now 16. The encounter lasted probably five minutes. It was very different. We were walking around, and we heard the noises. We looked up, and it was just standing there. It was eating something. We couldn't tell what it was. We stood there and looked at it, trying not to make a noise, but at the same time, trying to get our camera out. We could not get it on video or picture by the time we got at our camera. It was off. While it was running, the ground shook, and it grunted and screamed. 
It sounded very much like a coyote, and right after we heard another off in the distance. It was around seven and a half feet tall, very hairy, and had a lot of muscle on its neck and arms. On to the next one. In 2000, I was working for a grain handling company. We would travel around to different farms and service their grain dryers and build grain bins. It was early fall, and two co-workers and myself were on our way back from a seminar in northern Ohio. We were on a backcountry road, and it was around 11, 11.30 at night. I was in the back seat on the passenger side. As we were driving, I was staring out of the window, looking up ahead past the front of the car. In the distance, I saw something in the ditch up ahead, and as we were getting closer, I started to realize that this thing was big, real big. At this point, the lights in the car had that section of the road and ditch lit up. This thing had reddish-brown hair or fur and was crouched down. Now, when I say crouched, it was in a squatting position with its forearms resting on its knees. As we drove past, I didn't see the face very well, but I do know for a fact that this thing did not have a snout like any animal I have seen or hunted. As I turned back around from watching it go past, the driver was actually rubber-necked looking back at me. The only thing he said was, I don't know. I've never talked about it until now. On to the next one. We are from Illinois, but are currently moving back to Montana. So last weekend, we were up there looking at houses, and we came back that night. We were heading south on Interstate 90 in just north, about three miles of Wisconsin Dells. Now, I'm a believer in Bigfoot, and I've been trying to get my wife to realize the facts, but... It has been a hard road to hoe, so to speak. Well, she was driving, and it was dark out at this point, and we were in the middle of a conversation about the house we had just put an offer on earlier that day. On this highway, there are a bunch of turnaround spots where the police sit and try to catch speeders, and since we had traveled this route many times, we knew where they are, and we automatically looked down them. Well... Mid-conversation, she stops talking, does a double take out the window, looks straight ahead for about 20 seconds in silence, then looks at me and says, well, I think I just saw Bigfoot. All she kept saying was how big this thing was. She kept using the word big, and she instantly said it had to be at least 9 to 10 feet tall and just as big as in wide. She said it was a dark brown color and that she clearly saw two legs and two arms on this huge being. We were still three hours from our house and we didn't stop talking about it at all. We were going 70 miles per hour on the highway, but she was certain of what she saw. Now, she won't admit it was a Bigfoot to me, but she cannot for the life of her come up with what it could have been other than one. The crappy part is that I was driving, and we had just switched about 20 minutes earlier. She wanted to turn around and go back, even after we were two hours south of the location. Just from her reaction, I know she saw one. I have been researching them for about three solid years, but I have been a believer since I saw the patty footage when I was 14. I wanted to share this awesome thing. I truly wish it would have been me that saw it. And honestly, my wife now wishes it didn't happen because she can't wrap her mind around it. On to the next one. In Van Buren County in Iowa, my girlfriend and I believe there is a family of Bigfoot hanging around the lake in Lacey Kasukwa State Park. We have been experiencing huge rocks being thrown in the lake at night and whoop calls and whistles since late March 2012. We were walking on a trail on October 19th, 2013 at about 8.30 p.m. 
when all of a sudden a huge rock smacked the water no more than 200 feet from us. I let out my whoop call that I do and got a low whoop right back. It came from up at the dam where the truck was parked. Then others joined in and then it became very quiet. My girlfriend heard a whistle in between them, which I had heard that spring. She immediately thought campers were messing with us because it sounded so human and imitated my whoop. But there are no people out there walking in the dark on the trail, just us. Then Sunday night at the same time, I threw a big rock in the water. And not long after, a huge rock was thrown in by something, followed by a beaver smacking its tail, which we later saw gnawing on a log along the water's edge. I let out my whoop, but no answer. I told her, let's go over to the beach on the other side and scan the shoreline with our flashlight. As we got down the steps, I spotted big eyes and high off the ground, and I told her to look, and by the time she looked, it had left, and I know it wasn't a deer or a black bear. It looked like it crouched down out of sight. It may be the one that threw the rock in earlier. After that, I started offering food gifts, and they were disappearing regularly until the lake froze up and the snow started falling. I guess it was so it wouldn't leave footprints. I couldn't find any evidence of native animals doing this. In late March 2012, we smelled a strong odor like a rotting animal carcass that just faded away along the trails. Just we got to the lake and two huge rocks hit the water. The last one sounded much larger. She thought fish were jumping, but I said those were big rocks. Right there, I knew we had Bigfoot, since I've seen them years ago. Then, in October 2012, five huge rocks were thrown in on the same side we were on, and the last sounded further down, and after the last, we heard a whoop on the other side of us, and I whooped, and it responded right back. She says she doesn't remember hearing the first one, but heard it mock me, and was higher pitched with the quality of a chimpanzee, and it sounded female. We heard nothing before or after. In June of 2013, I was out there by myself, whooping, and I got a low whoop right back, and it sounded very human. And then the others joined in the back in the woods. Then a big pack of coyotes started yipping nearby, followed by barred owls hooting everywhere. According to the whoops, we may be dealing with some sort of highly intelligent humans or hybrids. There is no doubt in my mind that Bigfoot is doing this and not human. A local man says he saw a Bigfoot in the campground go behind the restroom building as he got up to smoke around 2 a.m. in July of 2012. He said it was 8 to 9 feet tall, long, brown hair, and its hands were bigger than his head. He is totally scared of them and is convinced they are out to hurt him and said he saw one in the park back in the 1980s. Also, campers have reported their RVs being shaken. However, we haven't felt any kind of danger from them. Instead, they move away very quietly. We both believe they are trying to communicate with us and among themselves. They sound more human than ape to us. It would totally amaze even the most skeptical person who is questioning the existence of Bigfoot. I'm hoping to get all of this on a voice recorder this year. I was with a party of elk hunters near Kamloops, British Columbia. My father and three of his friends, whom he had hunted with for many years, had accepted me to accompany them to an area of British Columbia where they had hunted each year on the same property that was owned by one of Dad's business associates in Seattle. All five of us were from Bellingham, Washington, and the man whose land we would be on had been a dream of his. He had a fairly large log cabin built on it. A mountain stream flowed down past the cabin, and a short 50 yards below it, the stream formed a fairly good-sized pond about a 100 feet across and maybe 8 feet deep before it flowed out the other end 
and continued downhill to a large river below. I will not mention the river, as the location would be a giveaway, and the place's privacy would be compromised. Dad had arranged by phone to have a guide, horses, and mules, and a fully stocked supply of food and other necessary extras to make it as enjoyable as possible. Each year, this party had hunted the same area, and each year had been about the same as they had always each shot an elk. The only difference was last year's hunt, which I heard all of the details about on our first evening in the cabin. What was different about the previous year was what the oldest member of the group had run into the third day of the hunt. No one would tell me, just that I'd find out the next day. Riley had decided that he would take it easy last year, so when they left camp to go their separate ways for the day's hunt, he chose an area that none of them had hunted before. Instead of descending deep down into the canyon and hunting the vast pine-covered plateaus, Riley went due north of the cabin along a fairly flat area that wrapped around to the other side of the large monolith that acted as a landmark for these friends to always find their way back to their cabin among the larger pines. Since I had never hunted such rugged terrain, it was decided that I should accompany Riley, to which I readily agreed. He was a man of 65, and with him slowing down and me barely able to keep up, we were a perfect match. Riley and I walked toward his destination, chatting mainly about what I should be learning, how to walk stealthily and quietly, where to place my feet, and how to walk almost like a stick from the waist up. The knack of proper stealth was only to move from the waist down and watch not to step on sticks, pine cones, or loose rocks. After three hours of Riley's constant whispered instructions, I began to feel confident. Then I tripped over a log and fell flat on my face on top of a bramble bush. So much for my Davy Crockett act. Riley was grinning ear to ear as he helped me check my rifle for damage, but the only marks remaining were on my pride. Riley suddenly stopped after I had once again asked about his experience on last year's hunt that no one would tell me about. He pointed to a large, dead tree that had fallen so long ago that there were almost no branches remaining. So, we stopped for lunch. We sat facing each other, both straddling the huge tree. And it was then that Riley told me about the mountain ape he met last year. He thought the reason nobody wanted to talk about it was because, in his excitement, he hadn't told it right because my dad and the others had looked at him like he was crazy, and they kept poking fun by asking if he'd been drinking, or maybe he'd fallen asleep and dreamed it. They gave him such a hard time about it that he gave up talking about it anymore. He told me he was glad to have my young eyes with him, in case we ran across the mountain ape again. Then I learned that Riley had encountered a Sasquatch. He still didn't wish to elaborate, other than to give me a very believable description of it. After we had rested, we continued to walk, close to the sparse vegetation that consisted of berry bushes, thick to thin brush, and smaller trees along the outside edge of the dense forest along this fairly flat area. There was a downhill slant that made us stick to the animal trails that would lead toward a dark, dense, forested area beneath a high parapet up about a quarter of a mile ahead. Off in the distance to our left, the scenery was fantastic. There, over the valley, were thin, white, and gray wispy clouds with a myriad of mountain peaks protruding into the beautiful blue sky. It seemed like it went on forever to the fog-shrouded mountain. We stayed at about the same elevation, so in case we managed to beg an elk, we could call for the main party to come with the mule to drag it back to camp. All of a sudden, Riley told me to duck as he grabbed my arm, pulling me down to my knees. 
and I was about to ask why when I followed his gaze to a heavily forested area directly ahead of the trail and about a 30 degree angle below us. I was expecting to see an elk, but instead I was looking at a large creature that I could have easily mistaken for a gorilla, except for the fact that it moved more gracefully. It was screened by a heavy area of brush, and had we not been at such a steep angle, we would have missed it entirely. It also seemed more like a man, as it was not stooped over like a gorilla, and seemed shaped more like a large hairy human than a hunchbacked ape. Its arms were longer in proportion to its body than a man, but when it moved, it was more like a human than the back-and-forth rocking of the body as the gorillas in the zoo's act. As we were both sitting on the ground behind a raspberry bush, the creature had not even seen us. Then we got our answer as to how we were able to get so close without it seeing us. The Sasquatch, we knew it had to be, was carefully inserting a long stick into a monstrously large cone that must have been a bee's nest. Then it slowly pulled the stick out and licked the honey from the stick with its enormously long tongue. All the while, it was swiping the air with its other long hand at the cloud of bees that were a constant swirling shadow of angry insects. As Riley and I both watched, not daring to move, the huge animal suddenly lifted its head and looked like it was sniffing the air. Then it focused its gaze on where we were squatting behind the brush, and within two seconds, it was gone. We realized that it must have caught our scent, so we stood up to return to camp. As the way ahead dropped sharply downward, and we didn't relish the thought of trying to pull an elk up out of that area, even if we got one, especially since it was so late in the day. Returning to join our comrades, we met them as they also happened to be returning at the same time. That evening at dinner, everybody took turns discussing their hunts, but Riley and I kept quiet and just said we didn't see even a track. Dad has always been able to read me and when he noticed my inquisitive glance at Riley, and then Riley giving a slight shake of his head, Dad demanded to know what was up. Riley gave an audible sigh and agreed to tell about our experience. He began by reminding the others as to how much ribbing he took the previous year when he tried to tell his story. Then he finished telling about our experience, to which they now paid close attention. Then he turned to me and gave me the chance to tell what I had experienced. When I finished telling what I had observed, I turned the floor back to Riley and he added his feelings on what his interpretation had been. As a group, we elected to put our elk hunt on hold. We could always hunt elk and we decided to return where Riley and I had watched the Sasquatch that day and explore for this fascinating creature. All of us were familiar with Sasquatch stories, but up until now, we had all assumed there was an explanation to these imaginary sightings. But we were now a team of six believers. The next day, we broke camp with an excitement that an elk hunting trip doesn't have. Only two of us carried our rifles, but we all had handguns, which were always our constant companions anyway. With Riley leading the way, we retraced our previous day's route. We certainly didn't expect to see a Bigfoot, but obviously we had to be very close to their home grounds. When we arrived at the remains of the bee's nest, it was deserted and in pretty rough shape with a few of the feisty critters making angry passes at us, but we spread out to look for tracks. About 10 feet down the slope, one of our party crossed a small creek that had two different sized footprints in the soft clay and sand along the creek as it wound its way downward. The tiny stream split into many small rivulets and they in turn wound around through the heavy foliage that covered every area of this extremely wet climate. Everywhere, the steep slopes were almost totally covered with a deep dark mattress of many varieties of plants ranging from deciduous trees 
to vines that entangled one's feet and legs, making it almost impossible to traverse such terrain in any reasonable time. In addition to the tough going, here we were, standing out on the steep slope and conspicuous as a grizzly bear on a sandy beach. We quickly grew tired of letting ourselves down these slopes, and it was a genuine relief when we came to an old logging road. A state of disuse was apparent by the fallen trees that crisscrossed the road, and in places, the frequent rains washed large parts of the slope down to block the winding road. We were glad to be so slightly inconvenienced when comparing with what we had previously been through. The road we were on was returning us in the same direction from where our main camp was, only about 1,000 feet downhill from the cabin. So we were getting closer to camp according to the familiar cliffs high above us. We came upon a deep ravine that seemed as though the ground had opened up, and we were now on a seemingly major animal trail. The five of us were walking single file on a two-foot-wide animal trail alongside the cliff to our left, and two or three hundred foot drop into a jagged, blackish ravine on our right. The animal tracks varied from tiny squirrel tracks, bird scratchings, deer, elk, and one big bear track. We found a rough, plowed trail where it went upward from the main animal trail. We were glad for that, so we made our way up to what was a better pathway. About another half mile, and there I saw it. Across the chasm, walking with a slightly hunched gait, was a dark gray creature that we all saw at the same time. The animal looked at us like it wasn't even worried about being observed. As we watched it from across the deep chasm, it looked to be keeping an eye on us. The Sasquatch seemed to be busy with lifting something out of a shallow ditch that was a branch of another creek that came down from the cliffs above. The Bigfoot animal momentarily disappeared into this rocky gorge, and a couple of minutes later, a small white-tailed deer came flying out of that hole, followed by the Sasquatch. It must have discovered or chased the deer until it fell off the cliff, and that accounted from my dad's comment. He had been ahead of us when he said the creature was throwing large rocks down at something. The large ape looked sternly at our party of smaller-than-itself intruders. Then it casually tossed the deer onto its shoulder, turned, and strode off into the widening valley ahead of it. It was totally out of sight in a few minutes, and it never even gave our party another glance. We stood there talking about what we had just witnessed, suddenly realizing in all of our excitement not one of us had even gave a thought of scrambling for a cell phone for a photo. Tyler said he thought about it, but was afraid to turn his phone on because the loud sign on Bell would scare it away when he hoped to watch it longer. That made sense to the rest of us, as cell phones were taboo on our hunts anyway. There isn't more that I can recall or any of the rest of our party could add to this commentary and our hunt ended four days later without even seeing a bull elk. We all composed and reviewed our story, and after returning to our homes, several of us had contacted the local authorities to make sure we haven't lost our minds. The BC Wildlife Management Services that charges those monstrous licensing fees for non-residents listened politely to the three of us that later visited their office and told us they believed every word of our encounter. This was not the typical denial from the government office that we had expected. Then the Minister of Game Management phoned his secretary to bring into the conference room the files on reported Sasquatch encounters and sighting. When two people came into the room with a large bin of files and placed it on the conference table, they opened it so we could see all the Bigfoot reports. We thanked them and left for home. That sure felt like a wasted day, as it was about a 200-mile drive each way. My name is Barry Cass. I'm a retired MD, and my wife Nellie and I finally closed a sale on a rather remote piece of land in Northern California. We have been working 
and negotiating back and forth for over two years since we first visited the owners when they listed the home and large acreage for sale. California has a full disclosure law, which states quite clearly that if there is any negative factor about the property that the seller is aware of, that it must be disclosed to every potential buyer. This is a really beautiful property with a gorgeous log home that was built on the property out of huge logs that were harvested from the massive forest where the home sits today. Our problem with the purchase came about purely by accident when my wife and I, the sellers, and the real estate agent were going over final details as to the date of possession and so forth. We had long ago heard that there were rumors of the infamous Sasquatch associated with these mountains, and my wife happened to casually ask if the sellers had ever seen a Sasquatch, and the seller's wife said they had seen them all the time. That raised a red flag, and our realtor, who up until now had just been sort of a tag-along and an innocuous individual with no real talent other than he had answered the phone when we called his office on the listing, and now he suddenly made a big deal out of this disclosure, quoting the California law as to how this was a total deal-breaker and that the suspicion that the Sasquatch creature was in the area was a liability that made any transaction invalid until proof could be determined to see if the animal really existed. And since he happened to be the seller's agent, the whole thing blew up. I stood up and stated loudly that the deal was off. I did, however, give the sellers a wink. That the realtor didn't see. My wife knew by my squeezing her hand that I was only fooling. So we returned to the real estate office with the agent, picked up our car, and left. I called the sellers and told them we were going to a different company and would be out with our own agent the next day. And that next afternoon, we signed a sale agreement through a different company. So the listing agent cost himself half of the commission. And our new agent said it was the easiest sale she ever made. After the sale was completed, the sellers welcomed us for a complete walkthrough without any salespeople present. We could finally learn the secret. Brief mention had been made from the very first, but after the earlier fiasco, the sellers promised to disclose what they considered to be one of the property's greatest assets, the Sasquatch. That statement really surprised us both, as we had assumed that the animals would be an interesting and annoying nuisance. Arriving early in the morning, we met the sellers under the large umbrella that shaded the hand honed log table where we had coffee. The sellers had lived here for 40 years, and they explained that they purchased the large acreage from the first people to settle here. That's not counting the Sasquatch. They were already here. Our introduction included a tour where we were chauffeured in their ranch jeep with top down through our beautiful new acreage. To our great surprise, when we reached the furthest point of our property and the U.S. Forestry Forest Department official wilderness area began, there was nothing more than a squared post with a yellow and green metal sign designating the area ahead of us. Our seller stopped here and went through a tailgate, removing two large burlap sacks and gesturing to me at one bag. He picked up the other one, and with me bringing the second one, he led me up the small hill past that government sign. We walked through the grass up over the hill and on the other side with a sharp drop into a gully that showed all the signs of being a major source of a runoff for snow and rain due to a total lack of grass. And even now, there was a small stream flowing steadily by. I followed as our guide made a quick left turn around a massive pine tree that loomed high above, and behind the behemoth was a large rock where we placed the sack. 
I followed his lead and set my bag alongside his. Then I followed our seller back to the jeep. For the last 15 or 20 feet, he made a roundabout trip so as to leave a confusing bunch of crushed grasses. He said that even though no humans could get here unless through our land, that on rare occasions a hiker or hunter may cross this mountain, but it was simply out of habit that he did it this way, as he explained that he tried his best to conceal the fact that a human had been here and thus arouse someone's curiosity. Then, as we returned by the same hard-packed trail and through the squeaking and creaking of the ancient jeep, I realized why the seller planted that small potato patch and why he implored both my wife and me to please continue to raise the potatoes. The Sasquatch seemed to really enjoy them, and then I also realized that his hitting the jeep's horn as we left the drop-off spot was not due to the rough bounce after all. It was a signal. We of course agreed immediately that the Sasquatch existence so close to our new home was really exciting for us. We felt an immediate connection with this place after so many years of wall-to-wall -wall people. Our tour was very pleasant, several hours, and we were able to use the Jeep to reach three of the property's corners. But it was a bit more effort to reach the last corner, as we had to walk a couple of miles, but on a beautiful trail that our guide said was a trail made by the elk herd that seemed to dominate the entire group of mountain. We moved in the next week, and due to the dirt road being quite winding after we left the highway, and especially when it came to our own two-mile driveway, the movers had to use three shorter trucks because the driveway wrapped around some ponderosa pines that were hundreds of years old and were likely growing long before Christopher Columbus was even learning to read his first nautical chart. It took a couple of weeks for us to move everything in, as this was our retirement home, so no more leaving things in boxes for the next move. We still had things we had moved without unpacking three homes ago. Plus that, we had to take a lot of time to collect the tools and supplies to live up to our agreement to plant potatoes the following spring. We weren't expecting a harsh winter, as everyone from the realtor to the sellers and even the banker talked incessantly about our living in a real banana belt even after we signed the papers. Even though we had been entertained by the seller's stories of so many years of Sasquatch encounters, we felt that these animals would naturally avoid all contact with the new humans in their neighborhood. Our nearest human neighbors were about four miles down the highway, and like our location, the only sign of their existence was a mailbox out on the two-lane road. It was paved all right, but due to the constant curve, a safe speed was around 30 or so miles an hour. This was a major change for us, but to prepare for this new remote lifestyle, we had agreed to take vacation to parks, lakes, and places where things were happening whenever we should feel a need to be around humans once more. We had so far been very pleasantly surprised to be quite happy with the small settlement and the group of stores only 10 miles away and on a branch to the main freeway, which was only 30 more miles away. Sort of like a link to civilization, but far away to not allow it to be negative. This was perfect, and we could soon survey our retreat. With its two large freezers and two refrigerators, we felt that this food supply with a full pantry we could just relax and unwind from 40-year careers of constant interaction with people. On the other hand, we were apprehensive about the fact that perhaps this would be too drastic a change, and our dreams would blow up when we felt the isolation aspect of it all. About three weeks after we had completely moved in and there was nothing but fun things ahead of us, our fears and lingering questions were answered. Sitting at our round umbrella table on the spacious wooden deck looking out at the sprawling pine forest 
stretched out before us as it led to the valley below us was a scene from a travel brochure. Then, following the valley wall as it rose up the other side, about a mile away, the massive pine forest again led upward to a hill level with where we sat enjoying our beers from the ice bucket I could reach without removing my crossed legs from the tabletop. Looking further above the far ridge, the snow-capped peaks far in the distance were a stark white in contrast with the cloudless azure blue skies above. Tipping my bottle to salute Nelly, my attention was drawn to a motion directly over her shoulder, and, without moving, I said for her not to move, but turned to her right very slowly. She did so, and there we were, sitting with a Sasquatch not more than a hundred feet away. The animal had evidently approached through the thick forest of spruce trees that spread thick in what looked like a wide band about a hundred yards across that stretched in a winding pattern that led from a far ridge and wound like a beautiful green ribbon across and down through the tan dry grasses and ridges of obvious ancient lava protruding throughout the valley. Nelly gasped as she viewed the scene with that five foot or so tall Sasquatch looking curiously at us close enough to see the facial features. We sat there in awe, and even though we knew for absolute certain that these beings did exist, actually seeing one for real was an experience we had not even remotely imagined could be so much of a pleasure. I think we agreed that it would be like a young kid finding out Santa Claus is real. Then, as if in the mere blink of an eye, we hadn't thought that such a large creature could disappear, but Sasquatch was gone. As we settled into what became a very relaxed routine, we made a decision to purchase a dog. In all of our years of marriage, we had not ever been able to own a pet due to our terribly busy schedules. It would have been unfair to an animal, but now we quickly agreed that this was the time. Besides, every home we had visited in our property, Search seemed to have a canine property alarm. So we began searching the internet for nearby dogs for sale. There were many breeders out there, but the first one we went to was a party only 10 miles from our house, and they were not breeders, but they had two German shepherds that were from their first litter. When we exited our car, the dogs were outside, and immediately there were two large noses and four small ones poking out the fence as we approached on foot. The puppies all looked pretty much like the next, and as I looked over at Nell, I knew that we were not going home without one. The puppies were allowed to exit the compound when suddenly one of the males walked away from the others and walked right up to Nell and barked. One bark and it was over. She reached down to pick him up and his tail never stopped wagging all the way to our home. Such an immediate bonding amazed us, and since neither of us had ever had a dog since childhood, he quickly became a spoiled brat. We named him Duke. When Duke settled in with the wilderness atmosphere, we made it a regular daily hike to walk the boundaries of our property, and we had, after the first four trips around it, thrown enough branches and brush out of our way that we had a quite clear pathway, and whenever Duke strayed anywhere out of this perimeter, we would call him back, so he soon learned that anywhere within this large area was home. The only times when he lost his hearing was whenever a squirrel, grouse, or rabbit were anywhere, and then he felt obligated to protect us from such dangers. Eventually, though, he would catch up to us on our walk after the danger was passed. There were a few times during our many hours of reading in our lounges on the deck that Duke's ears would be suddenly rotating like radar discs and his nostrils flaring. Then he'd shoot off the deck on a tear. After that, and an occasional bark or two, far off, he would be gone for long time. But while it was unnerving at first, it gradually became a routine. Then, one particularly beautiful day, after we had enjoyed steaks on the grill, Duke walked over to his place where he usually lay to chew his bone. With his huge, meaty bone, he had barely touched 
he leapt off the deck and headed into the growth of pine about fifty feet away and disappeared into the thick forest. There he went with that huge bone sticking out on each side of his jaw. After a few minutes later, we heard a far-off barking and whining. I was about to grab my ever-present pistol when Nell reminded me that was Duke Happy Bark. As I listened carefully, I knew she was right, because he did sound like he was yipping and woofing like when we play fetch. As we now intensely listened and worried, as any parent would, a half an hour later we heard a familiar woof as Duke came bounding out of the trees and down the slight hill, and as he came up the rise to the deck, his tail was wagging as he whined like we'd just come home from a long trip to the store. He leapt up on the deck, all the while whining and wagging his whole body almost in half. We noticed every once in a while, Duke would turn toward the forest again and give a sort of a howl, followed by a sort of yip. Something out there had really made him excited, and we reasoned that perhaps he had been chasing pocket gophers or squirrels. Finally, he settled down on his deck bed, and we continued our reading. We found that being finally retired was not as difficult as we had thought it was going to be. All the plans we had discussed over the last several years of all the places we had planned to visit and the list of things to do were suddenly not as pressing as we had predicted. We both were so impressed with the realization that we really didn't have to do anything if we didn't want to, and I got good at that right away. Assuming, that is, doing nothing would become boring soon enough, so come see, come saw. Duke had now increased his long absences, and we became used to his daily disappearances, and usually when he left, he left with a bone from our almost daily grilling effort. Finally, one day, we grilled as usual, but this time, we purposely placed our steak off to the side and cooked a singular steak just for Duke. When his steak was done, we allowed it to cool and then placed it in his large dish. Tail wagging, he eagerly took that huge steak in his drooling jaws and, without even a courtesy chew, Duke took the entire steak into his mouth and literally flew off the deck. Within seconds, he had disappeared into the evergreen. As soon as he disappeared, we were hot on his trail. He made so many trips using the same route that there was a well-worn path where he traveled. For these last couple of months, his absences had increased a lot, and now we were on a well-worn trail that made us acutely aware that his routine had been going on longer than we realized. The trail wound this way and that, around one tree, then another, that were spaced far enough apart that we wound back and forth, but the rest was only about a four-foot wide winding route. Then the forest became higher, and the trees taller and wider, and there was a ridge directly ahead of us. Right before we figured we would be climbing up the slope, there appeared a wide opening in the solidly green forest, and we heard Duke's familiar bark. Crouching over, we now took a very short step, carefully placing our feet so as to be as stealthy as humans can. When we found ourselves carefully parting the pine branches on either side of a large balsam, and there they were. Duke was on his back, feet straight out, and his head on the lap of a hairy animal that we knew immediately was a Sasquatch. The animal was about double Duke's size, which was about Nell's size, and the Sasquatch was vigorously scratching Duke's chest, belly, and his favorite, head, shoulders, and ears. Duke's groans of pleasure were loud, and even through those sounds, one of us must have made a sound of some sort, probably from squatting in such an unnatural pose as suddenly two large adults stood up from behind the pine trees, and there were four sets of eyes staring directly at us. Nothing could be done but to just back off, which we did in short order. Duke gave his familiar bark as he instantly dashed to our side, and of course the Sasquatch family had immediately vanished into the forest. Duke suddenly left and dashed to where his friends had gone, but he returned in a few minutes after his obvious desire to make introductions had failed. 
we returned to the house, and since we had plenty of daylight left, we assembled a quick care package with a few goodies. Having absolutely no idea what Sasquatch liked to eat besides potatoes, we gathered up some ears of corn from our local produce outlet, a few potatoes, oranges, and apples, and put them in a cloth bag. Then the three of us returned to where Duke and his friends had been when we saw them. We carefully removed the foodstuffs from the bag and laid them beneath the tree where Duke and his buddy had been plagued. Then we quickly returned home. We thought it funny that Duke turned and let out a couple of loud barks as we left. We felt that he may have wanted to let them know he had returned. After returning to the house, we hoped that our snooping had not ruined further chances of seeing these animals again, and we regretted being so impetuous and jumping the gun as we had. In retrospect, we would not have made our trip if we had known the Sasquatch were there. We both assumed that Duke had perhaps been playing with wild animals of a normally known type. At one point, Duke's fur had a slight skunk smell after one of his outings, and we certainly wouldn't have wanted to take the chance that he had become friends with the baby skunk and had yet to meet its parent. That would stink, literally and figuratively. Duke's visit had ceased after that, and we had forgotten the incident until our promised potato crop came ripe for harvesting, and as per our agreement with the previous owner, we bagged up the now larger crop on our 4x4 training car, as Nell calls it. We took Duke along as we returned once more to the spot where we had arranged to make the offering. We hoped that the same animals we had seen Duke playing with were of the same family, and in case they hadn't made the connection, they may now know that we were the same people who brought these gifts as well. It was kind of strange that as we got back in our rig, there came a strange sort of whistle from somewhere in the forest, and then Duke let out a couple of barks as if in answer to the sound. There seemed to be a whole other world going on around us. A couple of days after that delivery, we were sitting in the sun on the deck enjoying the fall colors when Duke suddenly aroused from his sprawling position and shook his fur, then let out a sort of snort and leapt off the deck and headed in the familiar direction as he had done in the spring and summer. We heard a couple of Duke's happy barks from out in the trees. About an hour later, Duke came bounding out of the pines and ran excitedly toward us, making his usual leap up onto the deck, but there was something different. Calling him to her, Nell was carefully removing a small vine from his collar and holding it up for us to see. There, attached to the long green vine, was a single yellow wildflower. We recognized the wildflower as having come from the field beyond the place where we had previously seen the Sasquatch. We were absolutely astounded. We have lived here for three years now, but I think I reluctantly ruined our relationship with the Sasquatch family. Just last fall, I took our usual offering of potatoes out to the regular drop-off spot, and as I left the place, I thought I glimpsed a movement in my mirror and I blew my horn. Now, before we moved here, I had spent a lot of time in my hobby of hunting and shooting, but Nell and I had agreed that I would never shoot on our new property, even though it was legal for me to do so. We had wanted to keep the peaceful atmosphere that we had so cherished. I confined my target practice to an old abandoned railroad barrow pit about four miles down the road that had stood unused for 50 years, as evidenced by a myriad of abandoned cars, barrels, and target shards on the various boards throughout the area. Anyways, always, whenever we were out there, away from the house, both Nell and I habitually carried our handguns for emergencies, as we still had no idea if there were bears or cougars in this area. Cougars are notorious for killing dogs in the region. A couple of weeks after dropping off the potatoes, I was taking Duke for a walk out in a part of our land that bordered the National Forest when a coyote suddenly shot out of a brushy area and made its way toward the ridge just ahead of us. Instinctively, I drew my pistol and began shooting at it. 
I missed, of course, but when I replaced my spent magazine with a full one, I was alone. The coyote was just a memory, and poor Duke was visibly shaking behind a huge tree behind me. The poor fellow wouldn't come near me until I had reholstered my pistol, and then it took ten minutes before he would even come near. I had totally forgotten that Duke had never heard a gunshot before. So we are now in mid-June. The snow is nothing but a memory, but from the total lack of any sign or trail and Duke no longer making any excursions as he would normally have by this time, I'm afraid I may have made a permanent change that all the offerings in the world would not undo. We can only hope that nature will forgive and that our most interesting resident will return. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!